morning to you. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Every now and then God lets me preach on some of my most favorite scriptures. Now there's more than one. But uh, today I get to talk about uh, the book of Psalms, Psalm number 103. All right? And it begins like this. And uh, Miss Evelyn and I would talk about this being, this is the, uh, uh, this is the blessing that you say after the meal when you forgot to pray before the meal. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Oh, y'all, y'all got this one? Y'all got it? Yes. I feel pretty good already, okay? All right, but anyway, let's all stand for the reading of the Word of God, please, this morning. You have one job today, and that's to praise and worship the Lord. I want you to kick back, relax, put a big smile on your face, and I want you to get ready to have amen me about a dozen times, okay? Can y'all do that? Let's practice. Amen. Amen. All right. We're off to a smashing start, okay? Psalm 103. We're going to talk about the first five verses, but we're going to read the whole thing because it's just gorgeous, okay? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Let's keep going. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is gracious, merciful, and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Amen? Right. Nor has he punished us according to our iniquities. We thank God for that. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to who? Children's children, generational righteousness and blessing, to such as keep his, co- as, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray. Lord, we do love you and we bless and praise and worship your holy and glorious and mighty name this day. We praise you, Lord, for who you are and all that you've done for us, Father. We ask that you'll bless our time together. Help us lay aside the cares, the worries, the struggles, the fears, the anxieties, and the pessimism, Lord. And help us to focus on all the joy that there is to be found in Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. I ask now that you would fill me with your spirit to bring this message for you. You and you alone are worthy, Lord God. We love you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' holy and glorious and lovely and magnificent name we all pray. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. I want to remind you of a few things. We'll put a little, pull, little pieces together, different sermons and messages that I've given you down uh, here lately. And I, one of them is this. Do you remember me talking about joy? I preached on joy. We had a series on joy. We have, okay? Joy is uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Is what? Love, joy, and peace, and a whole bunch of other wonderful things. That's the character of Christ. So we're talking about the joy of the Lord. And, and I want to remind you of the definition of joy. Okay? Here's what joy is. Joy is the feeling, the emotion that you have when you are aware of the blessings of God. All right? God blesses us all the time, right? A lot of his blessings we're just oblivious to. Okay? But when we are aware of his blessings, when we think about the goodness of God, Brother Ernie said, well, what are, you, what are you thankful for? What are you grateful for? What are the blessings of God? And he said, oh, salvation and home and family and church and good food and fun and all the different things. So we are, when we become a, and you did it with a smile on your face, didn't you? You know why? Because it is the joy of the Lord. Joy is an awareness of the blessings that God has given to you. Now, when you, when you want more joy in your life, here's what you do. 
you turn your mind and you start thinking and become more aware of the blessings of God in your life. So uh, that's why I like this particular passage of Scripture because it reminds me and it helps me. It gives me a, it gives me a starting list of things to say, okay, I want some more joy. I want to be happy for a while. So what I will do is I will become more aware. I will think and meditate and concentrate and I will give thanks to God and I will pray and I'll bask in his presence and I'll sing my music. I'll praise him, whatever goes on, because I want to be aware of the blessings of God because everything else is pulling and tugging for our attention and our awareness. But we have the power as people and have power as Christians to focus our mind and attention and say, you know what? I'm going to push all that stuff aside and I'm going to take me just a little bit of time here, whether it's a few minutes or a few hours or a few days or whatever, and I'm going to focus on becoming more and more aware of the blessings of God, and it's really, which leads to thanksgiving and praise and worship and the joy of the Lord, okay? That's the way this works. So here we go. Here's, here's the Bible says, look. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And to bless means to, uh, to kneel, to praise, to, to worship, to uh, uh, talk about the, the value and the, the worthiness of, of the particular person you're talking about. So we're, we're going to bless the Lord. We're going to talk about him and magnify him and express to him what we think that he is worth, for, for his, how, he, how he is worthy, his worth-ship, which becomes our word worship. Okay, when we worship, we're talking about the the value, the weight, the wealthiness, the, the glory there is that we ascribe or give to God. We're gonna bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Remember the first commandment, which is to love God with what? Everything, all that is within me. I'm gonna get all of my soul, okay? My soul, my my heart, my feelings, my mind, my will, my emotions, my personality, my faith. All these live in what's called the heart, part of our soul. Oh, my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. How many here have a name? All right, look, you got two, you got two kinds of name. Number one is the name that people call you by your name. Okay, here is also what you write down. Sign here, please, and you write your name. The other name is your uh, reputation. Okay, so when, so when someone said, do you know so-and-so? You say, yeah, I know them. What do you think of them? They say, well, they say, well, he, he, he or she, they're, they're this or they're that or they're this or that. And so your reputation is tied to your name. So when you, uh, we talk about uh, someone who wants to go out in the world and make a name for themselves, what are they talking about? They're talking about their reputation. Now, so we, when we look at the name of God, okay, and we pray, uh, we, we close on our, all, all our prayers, for example, uh, in Jesus' name, right? And why don't we do that? It's not just the name, you know, the, 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 the syllables that come out of our mouth as a, as a designation of the person of Jesus, but it is the reputation, what we believe about it. And so we're going to praise and bless and worship his holy name, all that he is and all that he's done. So that's why I often pray and that I thank God for who he is and for what he's done. His name and the person that he is, but also his reputation, his character. Okay. So do you have a good name in the community? Well, it's not just the, the, the letters that you write on a piece of paper. It is your reputation and what people know about you. So we're going to thank God for all that we know about him. Amen? I, I, I know. I, I caught you off guard. Remember, you owe me a dozen. It's like eggs in the refrigerator. All right? So you need to be a dozen. Okay? So I'm going to try to give you the... Uh, it, it, what is, an, uh, what is an amen? And the uh, preacher said, well, I can't get people to say amen. But the problem is this, is that you, you talk and then you end your sentence with a period. If you want an amen, you have to talk and end your sentence with an exclamation point. Okay? <laughs> Carol's on it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you, so it's not that big a deal because if you don't amen me, I'm going to amen myself anyway, right? Okay, but I'll try to say something worth hearing. I'll try to put a exclamation point on it so you'll say Amen. oh now we're cooking all right let's move on here so we're going to bless his holy name bless the lord oh my soul and forget not all his benefits if we say let's don't forget something that's another way of saying then let's what starts with an r let's remember we want to remember we want to think and we want to meditate we want to appreciate and so again what are we doing we're focusing our attention upon the blessings and the benefits of god when I'm aware of his blessings, it makes me happy. That's what my joy is. It's the joy of the Lord. Let's move on. He's got all these benefits. 
If we were to count our many blessings, as we sang earlier, how many would those be? A couple of dozens, a couple of thousands that we know about. It would be an infinite number of blessings, dear friend, I guarantee you. When you get to heaven and look back, you'll be shocked and amazed at the blessings of God from before you were ever born to the very, well, I'm sorry to say the end of eternity, but that's a, there's no such thing, right? Okay, let's move on. Here we go. Here's five of his blessings we're going to talk about real quick in uh, verse number three. Number one, he forgives all your iniquities. Now, I want you to know right here that all five of these and everything else, all these blessings, everything flows from the cross of Calvary. This is what Jesus has done for you. This is what Jesus has purchased for you. This is for you, okay? Without him on the cross, none of this even exists. All right? He's, first of all, he's going to forgive all your iniquities, past, present, and future. When were they forgiven? On the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He handled all that. This is the blessings of the Lord God Almighty. Forget not all his benefits. He has forgiven us of all our iniquities. Now the way he did that was God so loved the world, he sent his son, right? He went to the cross of Calvary. He died for our sins. And that's how he paid the penalty so that God may be able to forgive us. And later on it says that, that he, does not, he does not hold us accountable for our iniquities. He didn't deal with us according to our sins, but instead he offers us forgiveness, right? Now, have you been forgiven? Oh, yeah. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Will you continue to be forgiven? Yeah. Will, you give any, will you give God any uh, grounds to uh, uh, forgive you? Yeah, all the sin comes short of the glory of God, right? But at the same time, you already know. You already know. As long as the cross of Calvary stands in the past for us, okay? As long as the cross of Calvary is there in history, that means that everything purchased by the cross is still in existence today. And I have to wonder, does God love me? The cross says God loves me. I don't have to wonder, can I be forgiven? The cross says God can forgive me. And the psalm here says, and they were looking forward to the cross. We look back to the cross, okay? But it's still the same cross, and it's still the forgiveness of God Almighty. Let's look at the next thing he said. Not only does he forgive all our iniquities, but he also heals all our diseases. He heals all of our diseases. Now, you look around the world today and you think, well, you know, God, you've got, you got a backlog here, right? Has God healed you of everything? Not yet. Here's how, here's how you need to look at this. And it, from, uh, we'll look at it from a, from a personal thing. First of all, let's look at it this way. I can tell you that every single thing that I have been healed of is God that did it. It's God that did it. He healed. Whether it's because he made a, a human body that, that wants to heal, you, your body your body wants to, have, wants to heal. Amen? It wants to be healthy. It wants to live. It wants to be healed. That's why it works. It keeps you going. And God made you that way so that you, you know, I got a, I, I complained about this little scratch on my hand here because that should have been healed up days ago. It's taken... It's taking longer. Maybe it's because I'm getting older. No, that's not it at all. <laughs> that's not it at all. I think I needed just more knee sport, okay? So whether God just blesses me and I get over it, which is good, right? Whether it's because people of God have prayed for me and God has answered their prayers and get me feeling better, which is good, right? Or whether it's because God has blessed me with medicine and doctors and hospitals and knee sport, pills to take and medical insurance and with large deductibles, but that's another story. God has blessed me with all that. I say, well, hallelujah, thank the Lord. And so, and especially in this country, I need to go to the doctor. Well, they're everywhere. To our churches, they're just everywhere, all right? Some better than others, all right? We won't talk about it. But I got hospitals I can go to. I got a pharmacy. I got, you say, how many here take pills? How many take vitamins? How many take pork chops? You know, vitamin PC will go a long way sometimes. It'll make you feel better, okay? Now listen, uh, I'm not going to get up on a soapbox and jump around here today, but let me tell you something. There's a, there's a lot of a discussion and a lot of dissension about uh, vaccines and pills and medicines and all these things. And we're not going to get into this except to say this. Listen to me. Whether you are for it or whether you're against it, it's all about what you believe. It's about what you believe. It's not because you make more money doing one or the other. Not you. Okay? It's because of what you believe about. And we're all entitled to our own beliefs, are we not? 
So if you believe one way and if you believe a different way, that's okay. We believe a lot of different about different things, all right? But I have to give, I have to give the people around me the freedom to believe what they want to believe, which way it goes. If you believe, you know, uh, uh, it's, I'm not, I'm not taking any pills, I don't go to the doctors, I don't do medicine, and God's going to take care of me, that's fine. If you believe that God has given you pills and doctors and medicine, that's fine. But remember the, remember the commonality is what you believe. We think about it, and we see what we believe. You don't have to believe everything I believe. Matter of fact, I've discovered that as I grow older, I don't even believe what I used to believe. Do you? That's a good thing. I want my faith to grow and be expanded. So I want you to be nice and kind to each other, okay? We have differences of opinions, okay? We don't talk about uh, politics. We won't even talk about uh, football teams because everybody's different. And if everybody was exactly like me, everybody but me would be uh, irrelevant because they only need one of me on this planet, amen? The same way with you. So can we not be kind and gracious to each other? Can we do that? Can we not get along? We sure can. Can we not pray for one another and do what we need to do, right? Okay, let's just do that. But remember that it's God that heals us from all our diseases. Whether it's the Neist born that worked on that, put one more on there, and that Band-Aid, okay? Whether it's that flu shot, whether it's um, uh, vitamins and minerals and, and uh, eating right, we don't, no, we don't talk about eating right this week. Bad week for that. <laughs> Bad week for that. But all these things are because God makes it work. Here's the other way to look at it. I don't look like much today, but you check back in 100 years and see if I'm not healed of everything. Amen? 100 years from now, buddy, I'll be, I'll be shining like a star. Right? Now listen, when I get to heaven, it's all going to be okay. But now I will discover, bear with me, when I get to heaven, I will discover that God healed me from all my diseases. But disease does not just include uh, viruses and bacteria and infections and things of this nature. Diseases also include, what God needs to heal me from is uh, some stinking thinking in my brain, some bad ideas, some faith that doesn't work, some misunderstanding, a bunch of stuff and nonsense that I learned way back when I was a kid, and I'm still just now figuring out, well, that was just preconceived notions, and, and they meant well, but they were wrong, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And I need God to heal me from my bad attitude. I need God to heal me from my uh, judgmental attitude. I need God to heal me from my pessimism and from my self-pity. I need God to heal me from my selfishness. I need God to heal me from my bad memories and my, and my past and the guilt that I still carry, even though he has forgiven me of those iniquities long ago. I got a long, big bucket full of lists of things that I need God to heal me from. I can't just say, well, God, heal me from this cut on my hand. There's a lot more wrong with me than that. And I want God to heal me from all my diseases, and then I'll get that when this old heart stops thumping and I shoot off to heaven uh, with a speed of holiness in the presence of his angels, I will be completely healed of absolutely everything at that moment. Amen? Amen. God's going to heal me. I get some of it now, and I get the rest of it later. Amen? Same thing with you. All right, well, we thank God for it. We absolutely do. Let's move on before I get into even more trouble, all right? Verse 4, who redeems your life from destruction. Remember Ruth and Boaz? Remember them? Boaz, uh, Boaz was the rich dude, and he had the land of the property. Ruth rolls in, and she's a widow. And, uh, and so Boaz is called the kinsman redeemer. And so the way it works is that you, uh, uh, if, if, if you got in trouble like, like Ruth, and she's lost her husband, and uh, they moved back to the Holy Land there, and they're trying to get by, and she's gathering up a little bit here, there, and yonder. And so uh, one day, old Boaz says, uh, yeah, babe. Okay. And so he, he latches on to her. He says, oh, my goodness, that's the one for me. And so, man, he, you talk about a motivated man, okay? He was motivated. And so here's how the legal system worked back in those days. You had to, you had to go up the, the line of, of, of relatives. And so he deals, takes care of all the other relatives. He talks about this one, talks about that one. You interested? You interested? No, that's okay, okay. Then he says, listen, I'm, I'm going to take my shoe off. This is just odd, right? This is their contract. And people don't read and write. Okay? So he takes, his, he takes his sandal off. 
in the pre at the city gates, which where the uh, city council is, and in the presence of witnesses, he hands that sandal to the other uh, other relative and says, "This is my pledge. I am going to take care of that. I will. I'm the next in line, and as a kinsman, I'm in the family tree of the, of the people responsible, and because of that, I am going to redeem. I am going to pay the price. I am going to take responsibility for Ruth, for her uh, uh, mother-in-law." And for any debts that they owe, I'm going to take care of them from now on. I am going to make them mine. They're part of my family. And all that property now goes in with my property. That's my responsibility. And whatever debts to be paid, I'm going to pay it. As a motivated man, was it? You know, love will do that, won't it? Love will make you do crazy, crazy stuff. And, and Mo Boaz was smitten. And so he was happy to do it. Now in this verse of scripture, he has redeemed your life from destruction. It's the same word. Redeemed. To, to do the work of a kinsman redeemer. Which means that the Lord Jesus Christ, he looked at you and he said, Wow. These are my people. Yeah, but they're a disaster. I don't care. Yeah, but they're broke. Well, I don't care. Yeah, but they're broken. I don't care. I love them too much. So the Lord Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. He went to the cross of Calvary and he paid a whole, all the price. Everything that was against us, everything that was wrong with us, everything that we didn't have, all that we owed, all that we didn't have. He paid all of it. And he didn't just give the cords of heaven his shoe off his foot. He gave everything he had on the cross of Calvary. He became our kinsman redeemer so that he could pay off our debts and redeem everything and make us his. We're part of his family, part of his, uh, his fold. We're part of his property. Everything we own, he owns. Everything he owns, we own. We're all part and partial of the same thing because he is our kinsman redeemer. Amen? Amen? That's what that's all about. So the Lord God has done that for you. He has redeemed your very life from destruction, from the pit. Where will you go a uh, hundred years from now without Jesus? Where will you go? Right? That's a big, listen, that's a big change, isn't it? I'd rather, I think I'd just rather go to heaven than go to hell any day. And I'm so happy to know, I'm so happy to know because I have his promises, because he's forgiven me of all my iniquities. He's healed me from all my diseases, and he has redeemed my life from destruction. Heaven's my home, and can't nobody do anything about it, right? And it's including me. I tell you, I like that. Let's move on. Here's the next thing he says. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. In the Old Testament, the word loving kindness, uh, that's the Old Testament word for grace. Just think of grace. Grace is what God does for you because he loves you for no other reason. He doesn't need anything for it. It's not because you earn it, deserve it, or you pay it back. It's just because he loves you, cares about you, therefore he's going to take action. Okay? Love's his motivation. Grace is his action. So in the Old Testament, our word is loving kindness. This is what God does for you because he loves you. And so he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Now, in, in the Bible times, there are a lot of different ways to be crowned, a lot of reasons to be crowned. We always think about the king sitting on us. We want to get this big, big metal crown, right? We think, well, he's got a crown because he's a king. Well, the king's not the only one wearing crowns back in the Bible days. Um, on the day of your wedding, uh, the bride and groom both, both they have uh, they wear crowns. It's a mark of special occasion, and it's a thing of beauty, and it's a, it's expensive, and it's a, it's something that they would put on their head and and uh, wear it and say, you know, this is this is an important person, or at least today it is, right? Okay, and so it was just part of their uh, part of their jewelry that they would wear, part of their insignia that they would wear, part of their declaration of value and worth and, and position in life. They, they would wear crowns. And back in the days of the, uh, the original Olympics, okay, the original Olympics, they would uh, fight uh, sometimes, well, if you lost the wrestling match in the Olympics, uh, they poked your eyes out. Yeah, yeah, poked your eyes out. So uh, you either, uh, you're gonna win, right? Oh, you're gonna win or else. So if you win, if you win the Olympics back in the day, you were given a crown. Now the crown is not gold, silver, or precious stones. The crown, the crown is made of the limbs of a laurel bush. Remember those pictures of Caesar on the money and all that? He's got these little twigs. Yeah. These are his laurels sticking out. He's got a little crown of laurels, 
And uh, you know that they'll say you, you, you can't rest on your laurels. You heard that? You can't rest on your laurels. That's what it means. It means, oh, you might have done good. You might have made a great, a great victory. But that laurel, that laurel wreath on your head is not going to last very long. Take back a week from now, it'll be crumbly. It's going to die. It was very temporary, right? Paul talks about this in the New Testament. They do all these things for a temporary crown. We do it for an eternal crown of God in, in, in glory. And so, listen, so God says this. He says, I am going to crown you. I am going to crown you. I'm going to have you come before me, and I'm going to take this crown, and I'm going to set it on your head. Okay? And the crown that he gives you it's not a crown of gold or silver or precious stones. It's not a crown of, a, a, of laurel of branches or olive branches or any of those other things. It is a crown of grace and mercy. You're crowned with grace and mercy. It's, it's God putting a, a, a symbol of, of his authority upon, the, uh, upon your head, which represents authority. And it is how God is saying, I have touched you. I lay my hand on you. And I have given you mercy and grace. I have blessed you and I've been compassionate to you. You stand as a representation, as a walking, talking, living, breathing example of what it means to be the recipient of the grace and mercy of God Almighty. Amen? That make you feel better? Yeah, put your shoulders back. Get your chin up a little bit. Yeah. Did you earn it, work for it, or make it happen on yourself? Absolutely not. This is the goodness and grace of God. He says, I'm going to, uh, this is your, your coronation day is every day as God crowns you on your head in front of everybody so all can see it. This is the recipient of the mercy and the grace and the goodness and the blessings of Almighty God. Amen. That's some good jewelry. Let's move on. Last of all, he says this. Satisfies your mouth with good things. Is that not going to be true all week long? Uh, how many of you are going to have your mouth satisfied with good things this week? Huh? Right. Right. Some of you took out a second loan so you can afford a turkey this year. The price of everything's going up, right? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. We've already got plans. You know, right? We bought uh, Cornish hens. That's our thing. I call them personal pan chickens. <laughs> and we've got Cornish hens, and we'll have couscous, and we'll have uh, that jelly cranberry stuff. Preacher got to shut up talking about this. We're going to have, no, we're going to have, we're going to have rolls, right? Uh, butter. And more butter, and some butter. We're gonna we're gonna have to make somebody a green bean casserole because I'm gracious too, right? That'll be sweet potatoes this and turkey that and ham over here, uh, lamb chops. Any lamb chop fans? That's my favorite. This week my mouth will be satisfied with good things. But it is not just what I have for lunch today and on Thursday and leftovers on Friday, although I'm really looking forward to that. It is because God gives me so many blessings and he just feeds my soul, he feeds my body, he feeds my spirit. He just feeds and feeds and feeds me and takes good care of me, right? Did God do that to you? My mouth is satisfied with good things, things that God says good. Now look, um, the Apostle Paul said this. Remember when he said, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Remember that? Over Philippians, I can do all things through Christ. There's another verse or two right there with it. And here's what he said. He said, I have learned to do without. And I have learned to abound. I can do all things through Christ. There are times in Paul's life when there was nothing to eat. There was times in Paul's life when he uh, went on extended periods of fasting. Okay, But he said this. He said, there are other times. When I roll up to the table and I'm all about the business, I have learned to abound. There's nothing particularly spiritual or holy about someone who doesn't make the most of the blessings of God. Amen? So look, we're Americans. I'm going to let us all off the hook because we know how to abound, okay? We know how to abound. You go ahead and give some food to other people. You take care of other people. That's the right thing to do. But when it comes time to eat, you know, thank God for everybody. Enjoy every bit of it. And then on Monday, we're all going to take all those clothes off of our treadmill <laughs> where they have been hanging since last Christmas. We're going to take all the, all, yeah, because we got to, 
we got to atone for our sin of gluttony? No, we're not atoning for our sin of gluttony. We are enjoying the blessings of the Lord, okay? He satisfies my mouth with good things. Whether it's something to eat, i tell you something else that's good in my mouth. is the praises and blessings of the Lord God Almighty. It feeds my soul, doesn't it, you? Uh, you you'll think I'm crazy, but I even like you people. I love you. I like to come to church here. I, I was late getting started this morning. Brother Ernie was on verse number three, and I was wandering in because I had spent so much time because, you know, I came in here, well, I need to talk to that fellow. I need to visit with those ladies back there, and I need to, I need to say hi to my people. I need to enjoy that. That's feeding my soul. It's one of the reasons I come to church, one of many reasons. But, yeah, I like to come down here and see you, okay? The early ones, the late ones, I don't care. Good to see everybody. It satisfies my soul, my mouth, with good things. And here's what happens. Look, God says, look, I'm going to forgive your sins, heal your diseases, and I'm going to redeem your life. I want to uh, crown you with love and kindness, and I am going to satisfy your mouth with all these good things so that all this manifold, many plethora of blessings is going to end up doing this, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. God says, this is what I'm doing. You're going to bless the Lord, oh, my soul. I'm going to think about his benefits. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to praise and worship him. I'm going to be filled with his joy. And here's what's going to happen. I will find the deep inside and all the way out to the outside. God has done this. He is going to renew my youth like the eagles. Amen? Amen. Every morning the sun comes up, which we're all very glad of. And when the sun comes up, the uh, it, its rays shine down on the ground and the and the reflected rays going in and out takes that layer of air and it warms it up. And warm air does what? And cold air does what? Falls down. And so God has the day and the night cycle and the spinning of the earth and the, and the roundness. It's, it's really complicated. Listen, uh, everything is infinitely complicated. Everything is infinitely complicated because God made it that way. It's just absolutely fascinating. But here's what happened. God warms the earth, and the earth warms the air every morning. And the, and the air begins to rise and level, especially if there's a place where you have uh, actual mountains. Uh, here in a, y'all know what a mountain is? Okay. You have to go somewhere else to find one, but they're out there, all right? Especially on the mountain. Okay, the, the wind, the breezes begin to blow. It goes up the side of the mountain and shoots it that way. Or a big mass of air is just warmed up by here, and it starts to rise straight up. Now, the eagles and the hawks and even the buzzards, Here's what they do. They wait around, they're up in their perch and they're looking out and they're waiting on it. They're waiting on this air to start to rise. And when it's time, they just jump out into the air. Because they're birds, they can get by with this, right? And they take those wings and they just spread them out. Okay? And they don't have to flap, they don't have to work, they don't have to fight, they don't have to, you know, expend a great deal of energy to fly. They just pull out those wings and just rest them out there just like and here's what happens. They find these, they, they find these, these seams in the air and these little updrafts that are going up, warm air rising. And they'll fly around there and they'll find, the, find one of those things, okay? And they'll fly into the place where the air is rising. And then they'll just relax. They'll relax and let, and let the sun and the earth and the air and the warmth do all the work. Just lifts them up, and just, that's why they go around in circles. They're standing inside that, that thermal updraft, and just get higher and higher and higher and higher. That's how an eagle, in, in other words, that's, that's how they get their, their their altitude. They don't fight to go from here to you know a couple thousand feet up there. They just ride the breezes, just ride the breezes, and they could just float around there. And they could circle around. They can do that for hours because it doesn't take them any energy, because it's the updraft that's got that they have going. Okay. Now listen, when we talk about these wings, y'all have heard this a thousand times before. These are the wings of faith. Right? Remember what Isaiah chapter 40 says? You got this knitted on a pillow somewhere. Right? Even the youth shall fail and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint. 
The wings of the eagles, they will mount up. They will renew their strength. Why? Because it is our faith. It is our belief. It is the presence of power of God. It is pray, praising and blessing the Lord that buoys up my soul. That's the updraft. That's the thermal that's going to lift my spirits. And every day, whether I have just a few minutes or a few hours, or maybe I have a few days, and I can focus and concentrate on blessing and praising and worshiping and thanking uh, the Lord God Almighty and enjoying His blessings and getting my attention upon Him, I will find that that joy lifts me up and takes me higher and higher, closer to God. And the closer you get to God, the further further you are, you away from, are away from this world. And from God's perspective, here's what you see. Like the eagle, okay? With eagle with his wings of faith spread out. And we're renewing our strength because from way up high, we look back down here and we find that our problems are very small from up there. But at the same time, we discover that the blessings of God are just everywhere. I got miles, square miles and square miles of blessings from God, opportunities from God, things that God has made for me, all that God has got going from there. And my, and my problem, well, it's not near as big as I thought it was because I'm seeing it from God's perspective. Does that make sense to you? That's why I like to be an eagle, not a turkey. Turkeys don't fly. The eagles fly up there. And we look back down, but this is, our, this is again, this is my wings of faith putting my faith and trust in the Lord God Almighty. And I take time to sing his praises, bless his holy name, read the Bible, especially the book of Psalms here. And it helps me to know that in doing this, my youth, my youthfulness and my spirit, my soul, my mind, my body. But how many of you, how many of you are older than you look? How many of you are smarter than you look? Thank God, I thank God every day I'm smarter than I look. How many of you act like a kid? You act younger than you really are. How many of you got your second childhood going? Third childhood, I heard you. <laughs> I want my youth to be renewed like the eagles. It's not about my knee joints. It's about my soul heart, a mind, will, and emotions, my relationship with God. It's about being appreciative and, and, and grateful for who he is and for all that he's done for me. If I camp out there, no, not camp out. If I can take flight like a mighty eagle on the wings of faith and see things more from God's perspective and less from my perspective, I will find that he forgives my iniquity heals my diseases, redeems my life, and crowns me with grace and mercy, fills my mouth and everything else about me with what God says are good things, and discover that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen? The blessings of God. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. You're so good and so kind. Lord, you take such good care of us, and everything in life that we enjoy at the end of the day, Lord, we understand it's your grace, your mercy. For, Lord, you don't owe us anything at all. So any, any moment of joy, any blessing at all is from the grace and the mercy, the goodness, the greatness of the heart of our loving, infinite, holy, righteous, merciful, compassionate, graceful, joyful, Lord God Almighty. We love you. We thank you. Magnificent and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, we pray. Amen.